If you look at Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse number 4, it reads, And the Lord hath sent unto you all his servants, the prophets. Then it says these words, Rising early and sending them. Rising early. The title for the sermon this morning is Rising Early. Now when we think about rising early, don't you think about getting up early, right? Waking up early. And sometimes getting up early, rising early is hard, hard work. You know, I'm sure we've all experienced where we set our alarms, we want to start the day early, we want to get a lot done, we set our alarms in the morning, and then it, it ring, it, you know, the alarm goes off and you, and you kind of turn it off, right? And, and then you, you turn it off and then maybe you wake up late and you kind of have those regrets. Uh, and so, you know, rising early does have that element, of course, of, of rise. Why is it that we would rise up early in, in the morning? It's usually because we want to get a lot done. We want to start the day quickly and, 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 and be productive in our day. That's why we would rise early. And well, while that element is true, when we look at the rising early aspect of this chapter, it's about acting quickly. Okay, when the, when the prophet speaks about rising early, he's saying, look, I'm, I'm acting quickly. I'm not delaying. Okay, and so basically, if you, as the title is rising early, you can also title this sermon, I guess, act quickly or don't delay. Okay, it's the same kind of idea. And I want to take this thought of acting quickly, rising early, and applying it to the whole chapter. Okay, because there are certain things in our Christian life that we ought to act quickly upon. Okay, not delay upon. And I, I think if you act quickly upon these uh, aspects that we look through in this chapter, you're going to have a more fulfilled, a, a more peaceful uh, Christian life. Okay, so let's start there in verse number one, Jeremiah 25, in verse number one. It says, The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. That was the first year of Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, uh, to the which Jeremiah the prophet spake unto all the people and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, okay, first thing I want you to notice as we begin this chapter is who he is preaching to. If you were here for Jeremiah 24, we saw that he was preaching to the temple, to the people of God, right, to the house of God, because he, he saw those two baskets of figs before the temple of the Lord. Well, now, who is he preaching to? He's preaching to, in verse number two, and to all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So this uh, prophecy, this, this, uh, uh, these words that Jeremiah is speaking is more general. It's to everybody that makes up the land. Believers, unbelievers, it doesn't matter. It's to all the people in Judah. Verse number three. Verse number three uh, tells us how long Jeremiah has been in the ministry. How long Jeremiah has been preaching this message of destruction, this message of judgment. It says, from the, 30th, uh, sorry, from the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even unto this day, okay, so this is when he started, on the thir 13th year of Josiah, to this day, as he's saying these words, it says, that is the three and 20th year. So 23 years. This has been Jeremiah's message. He's preaching this, think about this, for 23 years. I'm kind of getting tired preaching for Jeremiah every week. Okay? Imagine preaching these words for 23 years. God's going to judge you. Turn from your sins. You know, get back to God. You know, turn away from your... For 23 years. Could you imagine? And the people are still in their wickedness. The people are still not right. Let that be encouragement to you that go door to door soul winning. Okay, I don't think you're going to go 23 years without seeing a soul saved. You're going to see some fruits in your door to door soul winning. But hey, you may go weeks of not seeing somebody saved. You may go months without seeing someone saved. Well, if you start to get discouraged, just remind yourself, Jeremiah, 23 years, and the nation is still as far from God as they've ever been. Okay, so let's keep going there. The 3 and 20th year, uh, verse number 3, it says, The word of the Lord came unto me, and then he says this. So, as soon as the word of the Lord comes unto Jeremiah, he says, And I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye have not hearkened. What is Jeremiah saying? As soon as God's word came upon me, I acted quickly, I didn't delay, I came immediately and told you what I was revealed to by God. Okay? So, as we saw, you know, this is 23 years of full-time ministry of Jeremiah. I'm in my fourth year as a pastor. I'm in my fourth year. I'm still a baby compared to Jeremiah, right? I'm still in my early days compared to Jeremiah. But I want you to notice, as soon as he heard the word of God, Jeremiah acted quickly. He rose early. He acted immediately with what God wanted him to do with the words that he's heard. Now, keep your finger there, please, and go to James chapter 1 in your New Testament. Keep your finger there in Jeremiah 25, and let's go to James chapter 1. 
Because there is an important lesson that we can learn from. We see that a good man like Jeremiah, as soon as he hears God, God's word, he rises early. As soon as he hears it, he acts quickly. Amen? Well, we have something similar that we ought to act upon when we look at the word of God in James chapter 1 and verse number 22. James chapter 1, verse 22. It reads, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. All right, let's apply that today. Whatever you hear from God's word today, that's great, okay? But what does God want you to do with what you've heard? He wants you to be a doer. If you're not, if you're not a doer of what you hear, you'll be deceiving yourself. Look at verse number 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. That's like a, a, a person, look, a glass is basically your mirror. You, you know, you behold yourself, you look at yourself in a mirror, and then it says in verse number 24, And he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, hey, that's the Bible, and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. What do we learn here? We learn that as soon as we hear from God's word, we ought to act upon it quickly. When we look at the perfect law of liberty, when we look at this mirror, this glass, it's like looking at yourself. It's looking at your reflection. You know, when you read the Bible, you ought to see yourself in the Word of God. Hopefully you see some good examples of yourself, but many times you're going to see many of your sins. You're going to see many of your failures. You're going to see many of your weaknesses. Just when you look at a mirror, you may see many of your blemishes. You may see, I've got a lot of freckles. I see a lot of freckles, right? Uh, you know, teenagers go, you know, tend to have pimples. You're going to see those pimples. You know, as you age, you get wrinkles. You're going to see that in the mirror. But the idea here is if you come to church and, or, you know, you hear from God's word, you read your Bible and you don't act upon it, it's like looking in a mirror, going away and forgetting what you look like. In other words, if you don't act on what you hear, if you don't act upon it quickly, you're going to forget. Okay? Uh, you, you might say to me, oh, brother, pa Pastor Kevin, that was a great sermon this morning. Yeah, but if you don't act upon it this week, you're going to forget it. In a few days later, I'm going to ask you, what was that sermon about? It's like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I forgot. And that happens to all of us. Even I forget sometimes what I preach. Okay? If it happens to me, it's going to happen to you. All right? And so we ought to, the, the first point that I have in regards to this chapter is we need to rise early and be a doer. Rise early and be a doer. What does rise early mean again? Act quickly. Don't delay. You hear from God's word. You be like Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, I, I got God's word and I rose early and I preached God's he, he acted immediately with what God wanted him to do. That's how you need to be. Rise early and be a doer of God's word. Go back to Jeremiah 25 for me, please. Jeremiah 25 and verse number 4. Jeremiah 25 and verse number 4. Jeremiah says, And the Lord have sent unto you all his servants, the prophets. Now, what are all these prophets doing? Rising early, there it is again, and sending them. But ye have not hearkened, nor inclined your ear to hear. Hey, who's rising early in this passage and sending them? Well, if we saw that, it's the Lord that sends his servants, the prophets. So the one that is sending them is rising early. You know who else acts quickly? The Lord God. Okay? As soon as he saw this nation uh, falling apart, uh, turning their backs against him, he rose early, the Lord acted quickly, he didn't delay, and he started to send his prophets to get them right back with the Lord. But I want you to notice who it is that sends the prophets. It's the Lord. Okay? Why am I the pastor of this church? God sent me. Okay? Whenever you have a preacher come behind the pulpit, your mindset should be, you know, whether it's your pastor or some other man here that's getting up to preach God's word, you ought to have the mindset, God has sent this man. God has risen early. God has not delayed. He's acted quickly and he sent this man, this preacher or this pastor to come and teach us God's word. But then it says here at the, verse number, at the end of the verse number four, but ye have not hearkened, you've not listened, nor inclined your ear to hear. What does it mean to incline your ear? It means to angle your ear. To incline your ear means, hey, pay attention. Okay? And sometimes we can come to church and we hear the preacher and, it's, and, and to you it's blah, blah, blah. Who knows what he said. That's not how we ought to be when we come to the house of God. Remind yourself, God has sent me this preacher. There's something this preacher has to say 
Something God has to say through this preacher, and I'm required to incline my ear. I'm required to pay attention. I'm required to be focused and not be distracted with what am I going to do after church? Or be distracted, what am I going to do this week? Uh, No, you ought to be in the house of God, incline your ear, listen to what God has to say. Now, as I told you, it's God that is sending the prophets here. You know, every time that I travel from the Sunshine Coast, God is sending me uh, to, to, to this house, to this body, to preach God's word. Remind yourself this, brethren, it's not just my crazy idea to travel, it's God that is sending me, okay? God has a message for you. This is why church is so important, okay? Otherwise, you're going to miss the message that God has for you, okay? Church is so important. Point number two is rise early and go to church. Rise early and go to church. Act quickly. Don't delay. Hey, sometimes some of you do have to rise early. You know, I know our family, we have to rise early because we've got so many people we have to get ready for, right? The 11 kids. Uh, we've got to get up early. And, and even then, we're sometimes we're struggling to get to church on time. But you know what? This is an important part of your life. You know, when someone says, hey, it's Sunday. We've got to be in church. We've got to be in the house of God. You have to say, yeah, you know what? Forget everything else. God is sending a preacher. God is sending someone. God has risen early uh, to send me someone. Hey, we've got to act quickly. We've got to make sure we don't delay. We want to be in the house of the Lord. Please don't delay the house of the Lord. It's not just the preaching you come to be part of and to listen to. It's the singing of God's praises. Don't miss the singing. You know, this is our chance to worship God collectively as one body. What a great honor to be amongst the brethren. You know, nothing gives me greater joy than hearing the brethren, you know, belt it out and, and singing the praises unto the Lord. It gives me joy. How much joy does it give God, though? Okay? So we need to rise early and go to... And look, keep your finger there as well. Please go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, please. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 18. Because I'm not trying to talk myself up. Oh, Pastor Kevin, you're saying God sent you? Well, God has sent me. We see that in the Bible. God sends his prophets. God sends his preachers. But it's not just a preacher. You know, every one of you in this body has been sent by God to be part of this body. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 18. Look what it says here. And the context of this is when it talks about the body, it's about the church, the local church. It says, But now have God set the members every one of them, every one of them in the body as it have pleased him. Say, why am I in Blessed Hope Baptist Church this morning? Because God has taken you and set you here for his purpose, for his reason, okay? You didn't just randomly decide to come to church. No, God said, you know what? I need to set you in the house of God. I need to set you at Blessed Hope Baptist Church, right? It says at the end of verse number 18, as it have pleased him. You know, it pleases God that you're in church. It pleases God that you are here acting as a member of this church. So it's not just a pastor, not just a preacher that got sent to God to be in this house to preach his word. No, each one of you are important. Each one of you, God has said, you know what? I'm going to take this person and put them here in Blessed Hope Baptist Church to hear the preaching of my word. God has acted quickly. God has not delayed. Okay? And so we ought to react in the same way. Point number two was rise early and go to church. Back to Jeremiah 25, please. Back to Jeremiah 25. Verse number 5. Jeremiah 25, verse number 5. So what is it that the prophets that are being sent by God, what are they preaching? It says in verse number 5, They said, Turn ye again, now every one from his evil way, and from the evil of your doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever. Brethren, we learn something about pastors here or preachers, okay? If God is sending a prophet, if God is sending a preacher, this is what they're going to preach, okay? Turn ye again now everyone from his evil way. You know, preachers are supposed to call out sin. Preachers are supposed to preach against the wickedness that's in this world. And and preachers are supposed to call on uh, God's people to turn away from their wicked ways. That's what a preacher that is sent by God, that's what he does, that's what he preaches. You know, the preacher that refuses to preach against sin, that preaches, that refuses to preach against the wickedness of this world, you can chalk it down, they're not sent by God. Because the Bible tells us that all his servants, all the prophets are preaching this same message, to turn from your wickedness, okay? To live a life that is holy and pleasing 
unto the Lord. Let's keep going. Verse number six. And go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands and I will do you no hurt. What is that God saying? If you don't walk in my ways, I'm going to hurt you. But if you, you know, if, if, sorry, if you don't walk in my ways, is that what I said? I hope that's what I said. If you don't walk in my ways, I'm going to hurt you. That's what God says. But if you do work, walk in his ways, he says, I will do you no hurt. Verse number seven. Yet ye have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, that ye might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. So God is saying, yeah, I'm going to hurt you, but really it's your own hurt. You're doing it to yourself because you're not listening to the preaching of God's word. Point number three that I have for you, brethren, is rise early and turn from your evil ways. Rise early. Act quickly. Don't delay. Whatever sin you have, brethren, and you know, you've sinned this week. Don't tell me I'm not a sinner. You're a liar, okay, if you say that. The Bible says that if you say you have no sin, the truth is not in you, okay? You're deceiving yourself. You're not deceiving anybody else. You're only deceiving yourself, okay? Listen, we all have sin. You need to act quickly when you sin. Don't delay. What am I supposed to do when I sin, Pastor Kevin? First thing you do is bow your head humbly before the Lord and say sorry. Go ask God for forgiveness of sins, okay? I'm not talking about salvation here. Okay, salvation is its own topic. I'm talking about as a believer, as a saved Christian, you're going to sin every day of your life. As, as you will, even a thought is, or foolishness is sin, the Bible says. Okay, you think a foolish, stupid, wicked thought, that's a sin. Hey, rise early, don't delay. Okay, don't let God become angry and hurt you. What's the point of that? Okay, we don't want to be hurt by God. You know, we, we don't want to live a life where we're constantly contrary to God and we never humble ourselves and say, God, please forgive me. And why would we do that? Because God is merciful. He's long-suffering. He loves us. We're the children of God. He's going to forgive us and He's going to allow us to be in His fellowship, to be in His presence. You know, we come to church to be in the presence of God. Okay? But if you're full of unconfessed sin, you know, you're just full of pride and you just can't lower yourself and humble yourself or, or, or challenge yourself with the Word of God, you're not going to enjoy the fellowship. You're not going to enjoy the presence of God in His local church. So point number three, brethren, is rise early and turn from your evil ways. That is what God is commanding of you. Look at verse number eight. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words. All right, now we're about to read uh, some really uh, difficult verses, some really challenging verses here, okay? We're going to be reading about God's judgment. So it's important to rise early, okay, and, and turn from your evil ways. And one aspect of doing this is, well, we'll have a look at this. Let's read verse number eight. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord. So let me just tell you who the families of the north is. So you may remember that the Babylonian kingdom is coming to judge Judah. They're coming from the north. When God refers to the families of the north, he's talking about how Babylon is an empire and it has multiple nations, many families, right? Many nations, many families under its power. And so the Babylonians, they're not coming, it's not just the Chaldeans that are coming, but all the other nations that make up that empire, they're coming from the north, saith the Lord. Let's keep going, verse number 8 9. And Nebuchadrezzar, the king of Babylon, my servants, wow, God's servants, this wicked man, you know what? If God needs to take a wicked government, and judge a nation, that's what he's going to do. That's still the servant of the Lord. Even a corrupt government official is still the servant of the Lord. Okay? My servants, and I will bring them against this land, and against the inhabitants thereof, and against all these nations round about, and will utterly destroy them, and make them an astonishment, and a hissing, and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of myrrh, and the voice of gladness, and the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, and the sound of millstones, and the light of the candle. God is speaking about His judgment, that it's going to come perpetual desolations. Desolations basically means destruction or, or damnation. And God's saying, look, I'm, it's, it's going to be forever destroyed if you don't turn back to me. And He's talking about all the people of the land. He's talking about all the nations round about, against all these nations round about. Remember, Jeremiah is a prophet to the nations. This message that he's preaching to Judah, he's also preaching the same message to all the nations round about. Yes, including Australia. We're going to apply this today. Yes, including Australia. 
We can see here that God's judgment will come. You know, if, if a nation is wicked, if they turn against the Lord, God's judgment will come. And brethren, when you, I'm talking about you as an individual, when you live a life of sin, unconfessed sin, okay, prideful against the Lord, you know, not caring about the things of God, God will bring His judgment upon you. Okay? So point number four, in order for you, one aspect of getting right with God, point number four, is to rise early and fear the Lord. Rise early and fear the Lord. Act quickly. Have a fear of God in your life. I promise you this, if you have a fear of God, you're going to walk more righteously. You know, children that have a fear of the parents, right? Um, you know, that uh, I know if I disobey, I know if I don't do this or that, my parents are going to come uh, with a rod and smack me. They're going to correct me. You know, that fear can drive people to do what is right. Well, that's the same thing. You know, we need to rise early, act quickly, have a fear of the Lord upon us. Hey, don't think, well, you know what? I've been sinning. Hey, where's God's judgment? God's judgment is coming. Okay? Sometimes God just is long-suffering, He's merciful, He gives you time to get right with Him before His judgment comes down. But listen, if you go a long time with being far from the Lord, when His judgment comes, it's going to be hard. Okay? It's going to be severe, perpetual desolations. God will take you down. God will take you down even as His child. Okay? If you turn against Him, if you rebel against Him, if you just have a healthy fear of God, understand that God gets angry. Okay, that God hates your, your wicked ways and, and, and uh, you know, God is giving you time, you have that fear, it's going to help you to walk in a righteous path. Point number four, brethren, was rise early and fear the Lord, act quickly. If you don't have a fear of the Lord today, get one today. Get the fear of the Lord today. Can you please keep your finger there and go to Psalm 34 for me? Psalm 34. Psalm 34, verse 11. Psalm 34, verse 11. <clears throat> How do we get the fear of the Lord? Psalm 34, verse 11. It says, Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. You know what, parents? We need to teach our children the fear of the Lord. You know, pastors are supposed to teach their church the fear of the Lord, okay? And you know, I don't know what you think of the Jeremiah series. I don't know if you think it's too negative. It's, you know, why did Pastor choose this book to go through this year? Well, you know what? I'm teaching you the fear of the Lord, okay? That's what we're commanded to do, to teach our children the fear of the Lord. Drop down to verse number 16 in the same psalm. It basically keeps going. It starts to explain some of that fear of the Lord. But in verse number 16, it says, The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. Okay? So notice this. If you do evil, God's face will be against you. Okay? It, it, we think about the wicked nation we live in, or all the, the abortions and, and the wickedness, the, the adultery, the fornication that's going on in our land. Guess what? The Lord's face is against them that do evil. If you remind yourself this, Man, if I do evil, if I sin, God's face is going to be against me. Well, that's going to help you understand the fear of God. Develop that fear of God in your life. Back to Jeremiah 25, verse 11. Jeremiah 25, verse 11. Parents, teach your children the fear of the Lord. Okay? It's good to teach them the love of God. It's good to teach them the gospel and salvation. It's good to teach them all those things. But you must teach them the fear of the Lord. You must teach them the fear of the Lord. This is what's going to get your children to walk in the right paths. Okay? We're up to verse number 11. Jeremiah 25, verse 11. <clears throat> it says, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. This is the first time that the 70 years is mentioned. I love the Bible. It's so amazing. Like just the prophecies. Like God, you know, this, this, you know, whatever you think of Jeremiah, this proves that Jeremiah is a prophet of God. Because that's exactly how long the nation was under Babylonian captivity for 70 years. All right. Now, I'm going to quickly read to you from Daniel chapter 9. You don't need to turn there. Daniel chapter 9, as you know, in the book of Daniel, that he and his three friends, they were taken into captivity during this time by the king of Babylon. 
And there's something that I, I like what Daniel says. In Daniel 9 verse 1, it says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahas Ahasuerus, and the seed, sorry, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. And this is this. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Okay? So Daniel, as he's in captivity by the Babylonians, he goes, oh, you know what? I found the books of Daniel. I started to read it during the first year of King Darius. And there I learnt that we're going to be here for 70 years. I just, I love those little things. I love those little, you know, connective things that we see in the Bible. And what? If, if a good man like Daniel is reading Jeremiah, then you better get your head into Jeremiah as well. Okay? Uh, it's such an important book. There's so many great prophecies. Again, don't think of this book as just something in the past. As we keep going into this chapter, you're going to notice there's a lot of relevant things about our future. Okay? Or at least the, the last generation of Christians that will go through the end times. All right? Verse number 12. I'm not saying that we're necessarily that, that generation, by the way. I'm not here making a prophecy that Christ is going to come back in 10 years or 20 years. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, back in my sort of mid-20s, um, I was attending a church and uh, I kind of had a desire already then to become a pastor. And I was thinking, oh man, what do I have to do? Go to Bible college. Okay, Bible college, they'd say it's like three or four years. All right. And then I'll have to probably go and they, they call it deputation where you go around churches and you ask churches that, that they're going to basically uh, help support you. You know, one church will give you $50 a month, another church will give you $50 a month, another church might give you $100 a month, another church might give you $20 a month. So you're, trying to, you're going around churches, it's called deputation. You're trying to build up in, enough support so you can go out there and start a church or something like that, right? Something, okay, four years Bible college, two years, six years before I get out there and start a church. That's what I was kind of thinking in my mid-20s. Mid and then my pastor, you know, gets up and he goes, you know what, this was, so what was I, mid-20s? What year was, would have this been? In the early 20s, mid-2010s mid or something, right? And, uh, is that right? Anyway, you guys know. But he goes, oh, you know what, I'll be surprised if Jesus doesn't come back in five years. Like, if Jesus doesn't come back within five years, I'm going to be surprised, the pastor said. Now, he didn't say Jesus will come back in five years. He just said, I will be surprised. And I just thought, well, that's my pastor, right? He's a, he's a wise man of God. He knows God's word five years. But for me, six years before I start church, I guess it's not going to happen. Well, I thank God that he didn't go to Bible college, to be honest. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just trying to show you. I'm not trying to put words. I'm not, please don't walk away with misunderstanding. I'm not saying that we're going to be the last generation. We could be. I don't know. Okay. But the end times might still be 100 years away, 200 years away. We don't know. Okay, it doesn't matter. We hear what God's word says and we do what God's word says, regardless of what situation, what period of time we're in, and we make sure we do what is right. Okay, what verse am I up to? Jeremiah 25, verse 12. All right, 12. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon. Hold on, God, that wasn't that your servant? Yep. <laughs> okay, so this is what's great. Because Nebuchadnezzar is wicked. Now, I believe he gets saved at the end of his life. But he's, weak. he's a wicked man at this point in time, right? And his kingdom is wicked. They've got false gods and all these kinds of things. And you might say, well, God, it doesn't seem fair that you would use such wicked people, you know, such wicked authorities to make our life difficult. You know, to judge this nation, God may use that as his servants. But I promise you this, God would judge those same people. Okay? God would judge those same people. And it says there, I will, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it a perpetual desolations. God is saying, when I judge Babylon, they're going to be destroyed forever. That Babylon kingdom of this day does not exist anymore. Okay? But to the Jews, those of Judah, it wasn't this perpetual desolation because they knew they would be in captivity for 70 years and then that will be brought back into the land. All right. So we see God's judgment there between the Jews, but also his judgment on the Babylonians, the same people he would use to judge the Jews. All right. Verse number 13. And I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, even all that is written in this book, which Jeremiah have prophesied against, look at this, all the nations. That includes Australia. 
Don't forget, I keep saying this because I don't want you to feel detached from Jeremiah. I want you to understand and see the day we live in is the same as what we see in Jeremiah. All right? Verse number 14. For many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them also. And I will recompense them according to their deeds and according to the works of their own hands. So what's the promise? The promise is that our nation will be judged by God. Okay? God is a judge of the nations. Then, you know, the wickedness that goes on in our land will not go unnoticed. Okay? Verse number 15. And it won't go unpunished. Verse number 15. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me. Now look at this. Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Then took I the cup at the Lord's hand and made all the nations to drink unto whom the Lord hath sent me. So this is quite an interesting thing. God would use Jeremiah with this, I guess, this prop. You know, Jeremiah, as he would go, not just after preaching to Judah, he would go throughout the nations and he would take with him this cup. All right. This cup that would represent, you know, alcoholic wine. All right. And, and so, you know, he would go with this illustration and say, hey, this will be the cup that you drink of. This is God's judgment. This is God's destruction that will come upon you. You know, I'm reminded with Brother Dave when he gets up to preach, doesn't he often like to bring like a little illustration? I remember when you did uh, ne Nehemiah, didn't you have some bricks or something? I remember, I remember seeing some bricks. What else? You brought something else. The yoke. The yoke. That's what I'm thinking about. I thought, I thought you were hanging people. You know, brother, <laughs> you know brother, brother David reminds me of this kind of preacher, right? He's, he's got his little il illustrations going around preaching. Well, Jeremiah had a cup. He's going around the nations, right? And saying, this cup represents God's judgment, God's destruction uh, upon you. And then, uh, so, you know, he's not going around making people literally drink the cup. It's just, it's, it's an illustration, right? It's, it's to represent uh, God's judgment. And, you know, this is actually, uh, this is wine because it, it, it makes them mad. It makes them drunken in, in a sense, okay? And, you know, this is sort of beyond the scope of the sermon, but why would you drink this substance? You know, the same substance that represents destruction, that represents God's anger and God's wrath upon a wicked nation, why then would you drink alcohol? You know, if, if, it, if it's to destroy a nation, what's it going to do to you? Okay, it'll destroy you as well. Let's keep going. Verse number 18. To wit, or to witness, Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and the kings thereof and the princes thereof, to make them a desolation and astonishment and hissing and a curse as it is this day. Now, we're going to go through a list of nations that God will judge. Verse number 19. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and his servants, and his princes, and all his people, and all the mingled people, and all the kings of the land of Uz, and all the kings of the land of the Philistines, and Ashkelon, and Azar, and Ekron, and the remnant of Ashdod, Edom, and Moab, and the children of Ammon, and all the kings of Tyrus, and the kings of Zidon, and the kings of the isles, which are beyond the sea. The isles are the, the nations that are in the sort of Mediterranean region, okay? That's, they're referred to as the, the isles. Verse number 23, Dedan and Tema and Buzz and all that are in the utmost corners and all the kings of Arabia and all the kings of the mingled people that dwell in the deserts and all the kings of Zimri and all the kings of Elam and all the kings of the Medes and all the kings of the north far and near one with another. I say, oh man, Australia's not mentioned. Thank God. And all the kingdoms of the world which are upon the face of the earth. That's all of them. That includes us. That includes our nation. Okay? And then it says, and the king of Shishach shall drink after them. Now, I'm not sure what Shishak is exactly. I'll give you an idea. This, uh, this, uh, this, this uh, sort of um, nation is mentioned twice in the Bible and only in the book of Jeremiah. So if you can keep your finger there and go to Jeremiah 51. Jeremiah 51. Jeremiah 51, verse 41. I don't think it's complex. I think this is the correct interpretation. But just in case I'm wrong, it could be something else. But I think Jeremiah 51 gets it right here. Jeremiah 51, verse 41. Jeremiah 51, verse 41. It says, How is Shishak taken? So there it is. 
And how is the praise of the whole earth surprised? How is Babylon become an astonishment among the nations? So what we see here in Jeremiah 51 verse 41, all the nations will be surprised when Babylon gets judged. Okay, And then we saw the beginning of verse 41, how is Shishak taken? So I believe Shishak is just another name for Babylon. Okay, Which kind of makes sense. Because God is using the Babylonians to go and, and wipe out these nations. All right? To take them into captivity, to, to kill, uh, to, to, uh, you know, um, to pillage. And then it says, and the king of Shishak, in verse number 26, Jeremiah 25, the king of Shishak shall drink after them. So God will judge, as, as we saw, God will also judge Babylon once he's finished using them for his purposes. All right. Verse number 27. Therefore, thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink ye and be drunken. So you can see it's alcohol. And spew and fall and rise no more because of the sword which I will send among you. And it shall be if they refuse to take the cup at thine hand to drink, then shalt thou say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ye shall certainly drink. You know what? After Jeremiah's going around with his cup, preaching their judgment, God's going to destroy you, and that, like the people of the land of the other nations, we're not going to drink of that cup. God's not going to judge us. You know, we're not, we're not part of this judgment. What's Jeremiah saying, right? You shall certainly drink. Even if you don't want to, God's judgment's going to fall. You know, sometimes I, when we go door to door soul winning, you ask people and, and maybe you say something like, you know, are you concerned? After you show them that the sinner goes to hell that does not believe on Christ. And they'll say something like, well, I, I don't believe in hell. You know, they'll say, well, I'm not worried because I don't even believe in hell. Well, whether you believe in God's judgment or not, okay, you shall certainly drink. They're going to face God's judgment whether they want it or not. Sure. Okay? It, regardless if they believe it or don't believe it, you know, and, and here's the truth, everybody believes it. You know, within the heart of man, everybody knows that one day they're going to stand before God. Yep. It's just that these people that say they don't believe it, they just don't want to think about it. Yeah. You know, they don't want to acknowledge God. They don't like he, having to consider those things. Well, that's our job, right? Our job is to preach them God's word because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, uh, verse number, I lost my place again. Verse number 29? 29. <clears throat> For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name. And should ye be utterly unpunished? Ye shall not be unpunished, for I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts. God promises he's going to bring, he's going to call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth. Okay? God's going to judge this whole earth. Okay? And we saw the, con the direct context of this is what? The Babylonians. Okay? And then the Babylonians will be destroyed. Right. Now, this is where we want to take what we've read and apply it to the coming judgment of God. You know, God right now, you know, is holding his wrath to some extent. Okay? One day his wrath is going to fall severely upon this earth. The day of the Lord, the day of God's wrath is coming. It's not going to be toward just one nation. It's going to be to the entire world. We read about this in the book of Revelation. And again, I'm teaching you this because I don't want you to feel detached. I don't want you to think, well, that was the past, Pastor Kevin. You know, we're living in relatively peace right now. How does Jeremiah apply to us today? Well, there's still a future to come. We may be that final generation. We don't know. Okay? So keep your finger there and please go to Revelation, the last book in the Bible. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, where we're looking forward to a time when God will destroy this earth with his wrath. When we read the book of Revelation, these are the seven, uh, the seven um, trumpets and the seven vials. Okay? In Revelation 14, verse number 10, I want you to notice the kind of language God uses to describe this coming judgment. In Revelation 14, verse 10, it says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So God's wrath to come in the future, the end times, is being caught in the same way. This cup, this cup of wine, 
Okay? This cup of God's anger, indignation, His hatred toward wickedness. And the ultimate destination for those that face God's wrath will be in the lake of fire. Tormented with fire and brimstone forever and ever. Reverend, God's judgment is coming on this wicked world. Sometimes, I, you know, you have this mixed feeling. You know, you, I, part of me, I, I want to see God's judgment on the wicked. You know, God, please take out your enemies. Take on, take these people out that hate you and that make our lives difficult. But then I consider, but they're going to burn for all eternity. <laughs> right? And this is where the other part of us, we go out and soul win. We try to preach the gospel. You know, try to get people into the kingdom of God that they would be right with God and not face this wrath. We've got that kind of mixed emotion, right, as a believer. But uh, don't, don't, don't move away from Revelation. We'll come back to Revelation chapter 14. But the fifth point that I have for you, brethren, on this topic of rising early, rise early and rest on God's impending judgment. Rest on God's impending judgment. You know, it may seem sometimes that, how is it that the wicked just get away we're just doing crazy things. You know, Christians sometimes, even you just read this in the book of Psalms, Christians sometimes may get discouraged. Lord, I'm trying to live righteously. I'm trying to live godly. I'm trying to keep myself pure, Lord. Uh, but when I look at the rest of the world and I look at, you know, even those that aren't necessarily so wicked, Lord, they're living lives that are unholy and they just seem to prosper. They seem to be so happy. They seem to just be getting away with it, Lord. And, and that can get you unsettled. That can get you maybe even frustrated when you know you're trying to live a life that is just pleasing to the Lord, but the whole world is contrary to you. Hey, they may even mock you in the way you live your life. Well, the Bible tells us to rise early and rest. Okay, rest on God's impending judgment. It's coming. The wicked will be judged. God will balance the books. Okay, the people that have done you wrong. The, the wicked people, this ungodly world, that have done you wrong, whatever that wrong may be, brethren, it's not your responsibility to take vengeance. It's not your responsibility to take judgment, pass judgment. Leave that in God's hands. I promise you, you will be much happier when you can rise early, you act quickly, don't delay, and just say, well, God, you will balance the books. You will settle things. Maybe some of you have been cheated out of money, out of great wealth. Maybe you've lent money to people and they've not paid you back. You know, or maybe they've gone on a holiday and you know, boy, how, what, you know, why didn't you just pay back your loan that you promised to pay back? Okay? You know what's going to give you peace? God's going to balance the books. What, whatever wrong someone has done to me, God will balance those books and you move on with your life. Whatever it is, brethren, whatever wrong they've done to you, you know, act quickly, rise early and rest on God's impending judgment. It is coming. God's judgment is coming. And listen, God's timing is better than your timing. Yeah. Okay, God knows when it's the right time to pass judgment. I'm glad God is merciful. I'm glad God waits. Because some of us would not be here in this church right now if God acted quickly on His judgment and destroyed you. Yeah. Okay? So we need to afford that to other people. You know, that we give them time for God to get them right or you give them time for God's wrath to be built up. You know, for God's judgment to come. It's going to give you great peace. Rise early and rest on God's impending judgment. I hope you're still there in Revelation 14. Keep your finger there. Go back to Jeremiah 25. Because I want to show you just the parallels with God's judgment. You know, between the book of Jeremiah and the book of Revelation. Verse number 30. It says, Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar on high, and utter his voice from his holy habitation, he shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. What other parallel do we see here? The treading out of grapes. That's how you make your wine. Whether alcoholic or non-alcoholic, the first process is to, to trample on the grapes. Now you're there in Revelation 14 as well. Go back there and go to verse number 19. Revelation 14, verse number 19. Again, speaking about the end times, wrath to come, verse number 19, it says, And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and the blood came out of the winepress, even unto the, uh, sorry, unto the horse bridles. 
by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. You see the parallel there with Jeremiah? Tramping out the grapes? Well, God's wrath is coming again. It's coming severely. Okay? It'll be like just the blood, the bloodshed that's coming in the judgment of God. It's, you know, I mean, the imagery that God wants us to think about is the grapes being crushed and the juices just flowing out. Okay? It's severe judgment that's coming on the earth. Keep your finger there in Revelation still. Let's go back to Jeremiah 25, verse number 31. Jeremiah 25, verse 31. The Bible reads, A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. For the Lord have a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh, and He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. So I want you to notice that about the Lord. He doesn't just start with destruction and judgment. He pleads with all flesh. Okay, that's the job of the preacher. Go out there, speak God's word. I'm not saying preach behind the pulpit. I'm saying as you preach God's the, the gospel, you are a preacher, all right? You are pleading with all flesh. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Okay, that is pleading. But then, if they don't listen to it, they don't hearken, God says he will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Verse number 32. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. And so the, the Lord's telling us here, when His judgment comes through, you know, um, again, by the hands of the Babylon, we saw this already in other chapters of Jeremiah, where we saw that, you know, in Judah, there's going to be bodies just laying on the ground, slain bodies. They're not going to have time to bury the bodies. And you have wild beasts that will just come and devour the flesh. Okay? Well, God is saying the same thing is going to happen to other nations. The other nations that have rejected God, they're not going to be, bodies aren't going to be gathered. There's not going to be enough time to lament. You're not going to be able to mourn okay, because of the, of the captivity that's coming. And it says they shall be dung upon the ground. The idea, of course, you know, it's like it's going to fertilize the ground. It's just going to sit there. It's going to rot away and again that reminds us of the end times okay so go back to Jer uh, revelation now but this time revelation chapter 19 and verse number 19 i just i just think the parallels between these two books are, are too too great to ignore okay revelation 19 verse number 19 so this is toward the end of the wrath of god revelation 19 is the great chapter on the coming of the lord jesus christ to establish his kingdom in verse number 19, Revelation 19, 19, the Bible says, And I saw the beast, that's another name for the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth, so multiple kings of the earth, multiple nations, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the context, of course, the one on the horse is Jesus Christ. Verse number 20, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. But look at verse 21. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. Look at this. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So as, as Christ comes and destroys these armies that are against him, Again, their bodies aren't going to be buried. These bodies are just going to lay on the earth and the birds, the predatory birds, they're going to come and feast on the flesh of these people. Who's doing this, by the way, in Revelation? Jesus. Jesus. Low, meek Jesus. Okay, the lowly, meek Jesus. That people think that's different from the God of the Old Testament. It's Jesus doing this in the book of Revelation. It's Jesus doing this in New Testament times. Guess which God is passing judgment on Babylon and the surrounding nations in Jeremiah? The same Jesus. The same Lord God. It's the same wrath. It's the same judgment. It's the same person carrying out this. Okay? Again, don't get in your head. Jesus was soft and lowly and, and all love and he was different to the God of the book. That's the Father. <laughs> right? No, it, God, there is one God. And God is made up of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 
Okay? Jesus is the same Jesus, is the same God in the Old Testament. The one that's destroying the Jews in the Old Testament is the same Jesus that is destroying these nations in the book of Revelation. Don't forget that. Okay? Have a fear of the Lord. Have a fear of Christ. Okay? We are His people. We ought to be living in His ways. Now, we're getting to verse number 34. In Jeremiah 25, sorry. Jeremiah 25 and verse number 34. So this is the last segment of this chapter. And I want you to pay attention to this if you're a leader, if you have authority. So, me as a pastor, yep, applies to the church. Because it begins by saying there, how ye shepherds. We know shepherd is another way of saying pastors. So yeah, this can be about pastors. I'm not trying to remove myself from this equation. But we'll, we'll assume that this is about anybody in authority. Okay, this is about governments. This is about politicians, people in power. Okay, you know, this could be, uh, you know, uh, the employer in, in the workplace. If they have authority in the workplace, could it be to them? This is definitely to fathers. You've got authority in your house. You're the head of your house. Mothers, you also, you also have authority, okay, over your children, okay? So if you have authority, you say, well, I'm not over anybody, Pastor Kevin. Well, you've got authority over yourself. You know, the new man is supposed to uh, bring in line the old man that you battle with in the flesh, okay? So apply this. And, and don't forget, this is written, uh, the chapter started by Jeremiah prophesying to all the people of Judah. And then he's prophesying to all the nations. Okay? So this is not just about one office. This is about anybody in authority. Verse number 34. How ye shepherds. Because why shepherds? Because shepherds lead a sheep. They've got authority over the sheep. So if you're a leader, this is about you. And cry and wallow yourselves in the ashes. Then it says this. Ye principal of the flock. So principal means you're the head. It's like in a school, you've got your school principal. He's kind of like the head of the school. The same idea, right? So this is about the leader. Ye principal of the flock, for the days of your slaughter and of your dispersions are accomplished, and ye shall fall like a pleasant vessel. And the shepherds shall have no way to flee, nor the principal to the flock to escape. A voice of the cry of the shepherds and an howling of the principal of the flock shall be heard. For the Lord hath spoiled their pasture. You know what? The Lord can spoil your pasture. The Lord can spoil those that you have authority over. God can spoil the institution that you're over. Okay? God can do you harm. Okay? Let's keep going. Verse number 37. And the peaceable habitations are cut down because of the fierce anger of the Lord. He hath forsaken his coverts as the lion, for their land is desolate because of the fierceness of the oppressor and because of his fierce anger. Okay, so it, God has been refer referred to in verse number 38 as a lion. He had forsaken his covert, co or covert, okay? He's forsaken the place that he was hiding. The lion's come out and has destroyed the pasture. The lion's come out and has destroyed the sheep. The lion has come and destroyed the institution that God has put you over. Leaders, fathers, okay? Pay attention. Why is this happening? Because they refuse to hearken to the words of God. They refuse to walk in God's ways. Okay, And God says, well, I'm going to destroy your pastures. I'm going to destroy your sheep. The people that you are leading over, it's going to be destroyed if you don't walk in my ways. God will be like a lion that comes and destroys what you owe, what you own, what you're over. Okay? This is a lesson to leaders. The sixth point that I have for you, brethren, is rise early and lead. Okay? Rise early and lead. Lead the people that you're over in the ways of the Lord. Lead your family to instruct them to walk in God's ways. Lead your children to love the Lord, to love the church, to walk in God's ways. Lead those that you're over. Hey, if you're an employer and you've got an employee and you see that employee slacking off and doing a bad job, hey, rise early, act quickly, don't delay, help that person get right and be productive in the workplace. You know what? If I see a great sin in this church, I ought to rise early, act quickly, don't delay, and get that sorted in our church. Okay? If we don't do it, brethren, if we don't act quickly, if we don't uh, lead the people that God has put us over, God may very well come out as a lion and destroy. Okay? Why is it that I see so many children, when they grow up, leave church, not want to be in the house of the Lord? Why is it that I see... 
pastors' children. Okay? They grow up, they don't care about church. It's, it breaks my heart. That's one reason I did not want to become a pastor. Because I look at other pastors and I see their kids and I'm like, man, I don't want that to happen to my kids. I say, why does that happen? Why does that happen? Because the pastor okay, was too busy with his church and did not raise his children to love the Lord. He did not spend time with his children. Okay? We ought to raise our children. We ought to be kept mindful about the people that we're over. I need to be mindful about this church. Lead us in God's ways. Okay? But we need to act quickly. Don't delay. We see something not right. We need to fix it. You know, it can be uncomfortable to fix sometimes. All right? But if you don't rise early, God promises you destruction. He promises you failure if you don't act quickly. Okay? Rise early and lead. Okay? If, you're a, if you're a leader, if you've got authority over whatever institution that may be, rise early and lead. So, brethren, in conclusion... Let me just give you those six points once again as we look through this chapter. Number one, rise early and be a doer. Be a doer of his word. Number two, rise early and go to church. Number three, rise early and turn from your evil ways. Number four, rise early and fear the Lord. Number five, rise early and rest on God's impending judgment. And number six, rise early and lead. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father,